Hi, I'm Brian. Welcome to Outer Gefühl and welcome to a very special behind the scenes look at the brand new Škoda Octavia. Now, to say that this is a very important car for Škoda is to make a very limited statement. Since this car launched, or the modern version, in 1996, around about 5 million units have sold. Globally, it makes up about 40% of the total sales of this brand. So, to say that Škoda are really putting an awful lot into the redesign of this car is putting it very mildly indeed. We are going to have the opportunity to take a really good look around not just the estate, but also the brand new sedan version. So, stay with us. We'll look at the design, we'll look at what's changed inside and out, and talk about all the new engine configurations. Let's take a closer look. One meter 83 or 72 inches in width, that's about one and a half centimeters wider than its predecessor. So if you're looking at the car thinking it looks like it has just a little bit more presence, then you're absolutely right. Now, the early to mid 1990s is when designers really started using the wind tunnels to look at how cars should be formed. These two cars are particularly impressive visually for one reason. They're amongst the most aerodynamically efficient cars that have ever been designed. The estate version here has a coefficient of 0.26, the sedan 0.24. That makes them amongst the most efficient cars that have ever been put on the road within this class. Now, why is that particularly impressive? For me, it's because of this new design language. I would think that if you're concentrating mainly on only aerodynamic performance, well, if you've ever looked at early 90s cars, you'll know what that does to a designer's job. It makes it really rather challenging. So much has changed here in order to make the car look that much more dynamic. Now, it's not a new concept for Škoda to talk about crystalline design, but the idea has evolved and you can really feel that with the new front of the Octavia. It's a lot more angular, aggressive, stylish, and dynamic than what went before. To make that work within the design language, a lot has changed. The first thing that really pulls your eye is the way in which the headlights are integrated into this completely new grille. Now, standard for this model, you'll be able to get LED lights on everything. But if you want the optional top of the line, that's going to be full matrix. If you're not familiar with that, that means you can leave your headlights on full and they will automatically work around any oncoming obstruction. So a nice feature if you can spring for it. Look at the way that the bonnet has been drawn through into this grille with the headlight at the side. Everything about this looks very intentional. But I wonder, does it stay that dynamic when we get round to the side? Let's take a closer look. Four meters 70 or 185 inches in length. The car is about two centimeters longer than its predecessor, so about that if you're a metric guy. And as you can see, that angular design has carried on right the way throughout the side. A couple of particular changes here worth mentioning. One is this much more discrete line of the roof rails. A lot to do with the aerodynamic design of the car. These have been made a lot more flush and I think that only helps the car's aesthetic overall. These are custom wheels. They come available up to 19 inches now. And as you can see, they work very nicely with this car's angular styling. Look at this character line that runs right through the flank of the car and right down into the headlights. For me, that really helps tie it together. Let's not forget, this is a long car overall. Fascinatingly, even though it uses the exact same chassis or underpinnings as the new Golf, it is significantly larger. Now, a large part of the thinking behind that is to provide you with more car for less money. So, 
in terms of the design, I'm not seeing any compromise here at all. At launch with the three standard trims, this is what you're going to be expecting in terms of ground clearance. But later on, if you want the sportier version, that's going to be about 50 millimeters lower. Go with the off-road Scout, and that comes in around about 2020. Then you will be experiencing about an extra 50 millimeters of ride height. Now, you can get dynamic chassis control for this car, and on most of the models that are not hybrids, that's going to put you about 10 millimeters lower standard ride height. But whichever one you go for, I think you'd have to say the proportions work really well for this design. Round at the back, that angularity continues, and a first for the Octavia dynamic indicators. The rear of any estate car is a particularly challenging design feature. How do you manage to maximize the space that's inside without ending up with something that looks rather like a shoebox at the back? Well, here you can see there are a lot of levels that have been built into this design in order to diffuse the way in which you visually approach this car. Right from the spoiler at the top to the large, bold brand statement in the middle, down to the discrete bumper at the bottom. A lot of effort has been put into making this more visually appealing to look at. For me, it's a big improvement on the predecessor. There's a lot more happening here, but nothing is shouting or screaming at you. It's still nice and stylish and relatively understated. Now, car design is all about compromise. So somewhere, something has to have been sacrificed. With the full attention that's been paid to the aerodynamics on this car, and of course maximizing the interior space, if it still looks right, does that mean we're going to be compromised once we get inside? Let's take a closer look. Irritatingly with Skoda, when you look at some of their models, the challenge isn't to find out where they went wrong or stuffed you on the design. <laughs> the challenge is to find bits of it that aren't everything that you're exactly looking for. And I was really expecting to be compromised when I opened up this boot, but I have to tell you what you're looking at is 640 liters of load space. Now, if that sounds like a lot, it's because it is. That's 30 more than the predecessor. I'm not quite sure how that's even physically possible, except to say that they really have maximized the use of this platform. So you have all of the practical features that you would standardly expect from any Skoda, but this being the latest one, a little bit more besides. So there's just a little bit more space in places that you wouldn't automatically think of. Every corner of this car that could have been maximized for room has absolutely been taken advantage of. So even though visually from the exterior, the car doesn't look massive, don't forget it's not as big as the Superb. Well, I'm really struggling to think that you could have anything that you need to fit in a boot that wouldn't go into that one. But if that's not quite enough space for you, well, of course, you can always fold down the seats. Once you fold those seats down, you can enjoy up to 1,740 litres of load. Now, if that sounds like it's a little bit less than the predecessor, you'd be right. But there is a good reason for that. I knew there had to be a compromise somewhere. This aerodynamic shape has limited somewhat the amount of available load space in total volume, but don't panic because the overall length is actually slightly longer. So that means that really you're gonna to struggle to find something that won't fit back here. One of the things I really enjoy about Skoda is that for a car brand who insists they're all about value for money, the car that we're looking at here is in brilliant gray. That's not a new color for Skoda, but it is a new color available for the Octavia. What does it look like when we open it up? Well, apologies for the pinging. We are gonna suffer that a little bit, I think, because of the battery status. The first detail I want to show you is right in the door itself. Now, standard Skoda owners will be more than a little bit familiar with all of their simply clever, that's obviously a company buzz phrase, features. So you will be expecting me to pull an umbrella from the door, but look at this. Yeah, okay, it's only people like me who really get excited for this stuff. But now when you buy an Octavia, you get a choice of one of two things. You can either have the umbrella that you all know, or you can get this. This is a snow brush and goes into the side of the door. Now, whether or not you go with that as a feature, you get these holes built into the doors so you can store one of each in either door. If you want both, you're gonna have to pay a couple euros extra to get it. But you know, it's still a nice feature to have thrown in and it sits very nicely with the design itself. So what's changed here? Well, 
you can see the increase of angularity in the design here as well. There's a nice mix of materials. I guess some people are going to say possibly a little bit too much in the hard plastic realm, but it's all very functional, easy to keep clean, and it is nicely delivered. It looks and feels solid, and I think that's the most important thing. At launch, there are three different trim levels, active, ambition, and style. What you're looking at here is the style trim level. Now, if you're particularly interested in either the Scout or the RS, don't worry, they're coming, but they won't be here until some point in 2020. So this is the top trim for now. On top of many other new features, if Holger pans around to the right a little bit, what you're looking at are brand new seats. Now, of course, you would expect all of the seats to be redesigned for the new Octavia. These are bespoke breathable seats, so you can get heating and cooling through the seat itself. You can also get optional massage on the seat as well. So, if comfort's important to you while you're driving around, and, you know, who is it not? <laughs> then that could be a really nice feature. But you know what? There are always optional extras. What I'm really keen to find out is whether it's just comfortable to sit in. Let's take a closer look. Okay, so I'm five foot 10 in height or 178 centimeters. As you can see, it's relatively snug on my top half. Now I do have a particularly long torso. So if you're wondering for comparison, you can think six foot, six foot one. But don't forget, I have a massive panoramic roof here and that usually costs you about an inch in height. And I have not adjusted the seat at all. And as you can see, it does get lower. So you are going to be pretty comfortable in this car anywhere up to about, I'm guessing, six foot two. As far as the driving position itself is concerned, what you notice immediately that you sit in this car is quite how much the overall design aesthetic has changed. Now, I don't know if you saw any of the leaked concept drawings for this vehicle, but as is always the case with concept drawings, you think, yeah, how much of that's actually gonna make it to full production? Well, the answer is actually quite a lot. When you look at the interior of this car, it really is a radical change. So let's talk through some of those changes. One of the challenges of shooting display cars is that they have a very strange approach to how the power works with the system because they're set for display and not standard use. So I'm showing you this as quickly as I can before the system automatically shuts down. What you're looking at here are two 10 inch screens and that is the top level of the infotainment system. If you're still an analog guy, I'm happy to be able to tell you that unlike the Golf, you can still get the entrance level model with analog dials. So don't panic, it's not all 100% digital yet. But if you are a big fan of digital, then this system is going to work very nicely with another new feature here and that is this brand new steering wheel. So look at this. It's a two-spoke steering wheel, multifunction, 14 different commands you can run through the system here. And that means that you should be able to do more or less anything you want with the car without taking your focus off the drive. Now, there is one other particularly nice feature that it's also a first for the Octavia that comes out with this release, and that is a head-up display that has been mounted into the dashboard. That will project directly onto the windshield itself rather than having a glass pop-up coming through. So, in this car, the idea is all about keeping your attention where it's supposed to be, on the drive. Now, if you want to spend a bit more time looking around at the overall aesthetic here, as you can see, it is pretty radically different. There's a nice mix of different materials, and I'm not sure if Holger can pan slightly round to the right so I can show you just where. Do you have that in shot, Holger? Does yeah, that work? Yeah, yeah. So if you can see here, we actually have a fabric dash, which is a really interesting choice, and this surface-mounted display. Now, that is not going to be to everyone's taste, but I would caution you, if you're the type of person who's really not a huge fan of these standalone displays, once you get used to them, they're actually not quite as obtrusive in design terms as you might think. New also is this nice finger shelf to allow you to keep your hands steady while you're driving along trying to make the selection you want. The screen itself is multi-touch, but as I said, this is the top system. So if you go with something a little lower down, it won't look quite this dramatic. Everything has been kept as clear and uncluttered as you can possibly get away with, and I think that's really important as we move up to the digital age. 
Now, talking of the digital age, what you're looking at is another first. This is a shift by wire DSG gearbox. That means that there is no mechanical interaction between this and the gears. It only sends an electronic signal to the car, which deals with the gears all by itself. So, not to everybody's taste, but I think it is the future. What do you think about this finishing? Thomas is always mentioning the shaver grill effect on top of some of Porsche's models. I wonder what he's going to make of the shaver type effect on the top and bottom of this one. Well, they're all housed in a piano black surrounding, as is always the case. I'm still not completely sure I understand why manufacturers love this finish so much, but I can tell you that in this car, they have used a nice finish on the surface so it doesn't show up fingerprints nearly as badly as a lot of others. Further back here, you have a nice big shelf for a mobile phone. One of the features you can get as an option with this car is wireless connectivity between your phone and the car. Now that really is a lot less bothersome than having to figure out how to plug them in every time. So if you're a big fan of using your car in conjunction with your infotainment system, you will be able to get that as an option. Put together, I think the design language does work well as an all-in-one. Now, if it looks slightly familiar to you, it's supposed to. That's because this curve here is designed to echo the visual aesthetic of the front grille of the car. Now, I'm not sure how well that immediately pops out at you, but it is nice to see something as visually challenging and different as the exterior of the car. Well, the front's very swish and modern, but how about the back? Well, this may be one of the most surprising rears of any car this year. Why? Because the back of this car now offers an unbelievably large additional eight centimeters or three inches of legroom. Wow is about all you can say about that. We've already seen that the boot didn't compromise itself in terms of space, it's bigger. And look at this. Now, okay, I have rather disappointingly short legs, but even if you have Thomas-like limbs, look at the amount of room that you have back here. That's a really nice feature for an estate car. There is, after all, no point making one of these unless it very comfortably seats four people and all of their equipment. Well, I think you're gonna really struggle to find something on the marketplace that gives you more room and comfort than this does. And the attention to detail isn't only there. Look at this nice feature. If I can get Holger just to swing around to the rear of this seat. Well, we're all familiar with these rear pockets, but look, they've put a nice small one in for a smartphone. So your rear seat passengers actually have somewhere to put their electronics. And if you look down here, you can see they also have somewhere to charge them up as well. Now, obviously lots of these things are available as options, but you can also get tri-zone climate now, and that means you can get heating and cooling back here as well, but also heated and cooled rear seats to boot. Well, you'd expect there to be lots of nice little extra touches back here. It is Skoda after all. Here we have a pop-out cup holder, and of course, no estate car is gonna be truly happy unless you know you can fit your skis in and your children at the same time. So that's not the world's biggest surprise, but look at this. How's that for a nice bit of attention to detail? Ah, I could really have a nice rest back here. And look at the panoramic roof. Sometimes it can feel a little bit funereal sitting in the back of an estate car, but if you go with one of the panoramic roofs as an option, I can tell you, it's really quite impressive. You wouldn't expect the new Octavia to launch without a myriad range of different options available in the engine compartment. And don't worry, you won't be disappointed. What you're looking at right here is the two liter TDI, and that's producing 150 horsepower. But if you want different flavor in diesel, it can come as 115 horsepower or a 200 horsepower version. Now, if petrol's more your thing, you can either get a one liter three cylinder petrol producing 110 horsepower, a 1.5 liter four cylinder petrol producing 150 horsepower, or a two liter 190 horsepower all-wheel drive with a seven-speed DSG. Now, both of those smaller petrol engines come standardly as manual gearboxes, but if you want them with a seven-speed DSG, then you will be getting them as mild hybrids. 
But don't worry, if electric's your thing, you can also go with a plug-in hybrid. That's a 1.4-litre engine producing a system output of either 204 or 245 horsepower. That's twinned with a six-speed DSG. But we are not all done there. There's also a 1.5-litre TSI CNG engine, and that produces 130 horsepower. Sadly, we only have the time to bring you the very briefest of looks at the sedan, but you may remember me mentioning right at the start, this is the more aerodynamic of the two cars. So, obviously, this roofline is particularly sweeping. And where is that going to hurt us? That's what I want to know. So. Let's take a very quick seat in the back. While I'm doing that, what I can tell you is, if you're frightened about having lost luggage space in the back, don't be. You now still have 600 litres of load room, which is 10 more than the predecessor. That same massive increase in knee space down here. And I have to tell you, swooping roof line aside, you still have a very pleasant amount of room for your head. I'm five foot 10, 178 centimeters. And I would say that back here, you're still gonna be comfortable anywhere up to about six feet one. So if you're looking at this as a business sedan, I think you're going to be very pleased indeed. Well, that about does it for our very brief behind the scenes look at the new Octavia. So what do we think? Well, as far as the visual aesthetic and the new modern approach to the design, I have to say I'm almost blown away. Why? Because I really love that at the core of this design, efficiency was everything. So managing to pack so much into the design detail, so much of this angularity, so much of the new styling that really makes this car genuinely distinct but still a family member. You can still see and recognize all the bits that you really like from the recent superb redesign. That's really impressive. The interior, well, I think we're gonna split some opinions here. It's not gonna be everybody's taste to start with, but don't forget anytime you change anything, at least half of the customers say, I don't like it, I prefer the old one. So give yourself a little time to adjust. I really think you're gonna love all of the new technology that's featured on this car, and especially the way it interacts. I have to tell you, I am an absolute sucker for the Octavia Scout, I love it. When I read that this was gonna be slightly bigger, well, I was a little bit concerned. I mean, ultimately, it is still the same platform the Golf's built on. So if you're gonna use that platform but make the car bigger, will there be any compromises in driving dynamic? Well, we're obviously gonna to have to wait a little bit longer to find that one out. But in the meantime, pricing should be around about where the predecessor was, probably a little bit more, but not so much that it should frighten you off. What I really like best about this car overall is just how much quality has been packed into this package. I have to admit, I'm a big Octavia fan. I'm not alone in that. So are many other people around the world. And in terms of making them happy, I think Skoda have done a really good job. But tell me, what do you think? Put any comments and questions below. Please subscribe. And we hope we'll see you all again soon.